Hello everyone, my name is Julian Taylor and I'm a librarian at the English Montreal School Board and I'm also a co-chair of the Cuseland Symposium Planning Committee this year. Uh, before we begin, I would like to take a moment to recognize that the land upon which we live now was once used by others. The land under my feet here on the island of Chachage, or, or Montreal, is unceded land that has been used for thousands of years by several different Indigenous groups, most prominent being the Haudenosaunee and the Cayenne Kahaka. For those of you who would like to review the session again later, it is being recorded and will be made available on the Cusan YouTube channel and on the website. If you do not want your, uh, your image to be captured in the video, please just make sure your camera is turned off. Uh, there will be a period of time at the end of the presentation for questions. Uh, if you would like to ask a question, you can either use the chat function to, to write in your questions, or if you would rather ask your questions verbally, you can raise your hand, and by that I literally mean raising your hand, or use the reaction uh, um, uh, buttons within Zoom. Uh, we will invite you to unmute yourself to pose your questions directly to the presenters. Um, and now, it gives me great pleasure to introduce you uh, to welcome, well, that was awesome. And now it gives me great pleasure to welcome you to this morning session, Making Reading Accessible to Everyone. There will be three presenters, all of whom work together as assistive technology consultants with the Student Services Department in the English Montreal School Board. Andrea Prupis, Elisa May Farina, and Teresa Seminara. They work with teachers and other school personnel to help students access and use several different types of assistive technology in order to help them succeed and achieve their potential. There is a much larger variety of tools and resources available to our students now than even just a few years ago. Uh, there was actually uh, Andrea with uh, another librarian um, uh, an McIntyre a number of years ago did a, a similar presentation a few years ago. And this, I believe, is it's more than just 2.0. It's there's so much more than that 2017 20 presentation. It's changed a lot. So today, these three system technology consultants will share many of those tools and resources with us. And now on that note, I have Andrea, Elisa and Teresa to begin your presentation. Have fun. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Julian. And hello, everybody. Um, I'm going to share my screen in just a moment. I'm Andrea Prufus. Um, as Julian mentioned, I'm one of the assistive technology consultants for English Montreal School Board. I'm here with my colleagues, Elisa and Teresa. Um, we're super lucky to be three assistive tech consultants. Um, I think probably the only ones right now in the English system in Quebec. So I don't know why, but <laughs> that's us. Um, but we're very happy to be with you today and to talk about accessibility um, and assistive technologies to support um, our school libraries and um, you as librarians and also our students. Um, a little bit about what we do. We work one to one with students to integrate assistive technologies in our classrooms. Um, we also work with teachers and other professionals um, in our schools to really integrate um, accessible technologies or um, accessible resources into our schools. And today we're gonna to talk to you a little bit about accessible resources. Um, I do wanna acknowledge the work that Annette McIntyre has done. I don't know if Annette is here in the session, um, but I wanna acknowledge the important work she did to start this, um, to, to basically um, get these resources into our English school boards um, at the ministry level. And we've sort of taken her work and we've gone, um, as Julian mentioned, 2.0 and beyond. <laughs> so today we're going to talk to you a little bit about those resources and how we implement, that in, uh, implement them at English Montreal. Um, so here we go, I'm gonna share my screen. We pray that everything works today. Um, if you have any questions as I'm speaking, uh let me just share i've got a lot of things open here all right so as i'm speaking today if you have any questions just feel free to post them in the chat um and here's my slideshow and what we'll do is one of us will sort of be monitoring the chat as we go um, and we can take questions we can stop at certain times and answer questions okay um what what we'll also do is if i'm speaking uh, maybe teresa or elisa will just you know monitor the chat see if there's any questions questions and I'll do the same for when they're speaking and we can sort of attend to questions um, in that in that way. Okay. Um, we're going to be doing some demonstrations of some of our software. So Alisa and Teresa and I will be going a little bit back and forth. Okay. But if you have any questions about any of the software or again any of the resources, please feel free to to ask us. 
Okay. We know that because um, you are librarians in the Quebec English School Board, we have different options for technology. We know that not all the board, all, all boards have the same tools. Okay. So we try to make sure that this is, um, this is, I guess, platform, uh, what can, shall I call it, agnostic, <laughs> platform free, so that, you know, we're not discussing one particular platform in particular. So we'll share some resources that we have at EMSB, but we're also going to address other options that we know our school boards have. Okay, so let's go ahead and I'm gonna pass it over to Teresa. Thank you, Andrea. So um, just a quick overview of today's workshop. We've uh, designed it in such a way where we're uh, going to be breaking it into three parts. So the first part will be exploring the connection between universal design for learning, assistive technology and accessibility. Uh, part two will explore uh, a couple of assistive technology tools uh, to help increase accessibility in the library. More specifically, we'll be looking at text-to-speech through WordQ, providing a live demo. We'll also look at speech recognition in Chrome, again, with a live demo. And lastly, we'll be looking at a variety of curation tools that can help our students with research via read and write um, with a demo. The last part of today's session uh, will explore multi-sensory uh, reading with accessible books across three different platforms, so Sela, Bookshare, and Sora. So without further ado, part one, a universal design for learning essentially originates from the field of architecture with the concept of universal design, uh, which essentially means creating spaces that are accessible to um, all individuals, regardless of uh, one's disability to make it accessible, essentially to avoid retrofitting because retrofitting is expensive and ultimately it makes people feel like an afterthought and no one wants to feel like an afterthought. There, so there's this notion this importance of um, inclusivity in the design aspect. With regards to universal design for learning, it was introduced in 1984 by two uh, Harvard researchers in the school of, um, of graduate, uh, the Graduate School of Education. And essentially they uh, incorporated CAST, which is uh, known as the Center for Applied Assist, uh, Specialized Technologies. And their goal was essentially to level the playing field for individuals with learning difficulties by ensuring they had access to curriculum material with the help of assistive technologies. So Andrea, um, well, we'll actually take a look at this uh, cartoon and then we'll move on to the next slide. But essentially this cartoon does such a wonderful job, uh, we feel about um, enforcing, reinforcing the, uh, the notion of, um, of accessibility. And we see um, the individual in the left on a wheelchair saying, could you please shovel the ramp? And uh, the individual shoveling the snow says, all these other kids are waiting to use the stairs. When I get through shoveling them off, then I will clear the ramp for you. And the response is wonderful because again, it really hits the notion of accessibility. Um, but if you shovel the ramp, we can all get in. So essentially clearing a path for people with special needs uh, helps clear the path for everyone. And so if we move on to the next slide, we see that the connection between universal design for learning and assistive technology is very strong. And um, our work as assistive technology consultants um, really is based on this notion of UDL, on this framework, because uh, not only is it based in decades of research in neuroscience and how the brain works, but it, it, the focus is really to improve and optimize learning for all students with or without exceptionalities. So our work um, as AT consultants uh, is really focused on helping identify and then reducing the barriers to learning uh, to ensure equal access to learning opportunities for all our students. And this is where assistive technology uh, plays an important role. We know that uh, accessibility, um, that librarians play a big role in accessibility. Uh, we know that a one size fits all approach uh, to reading contains hidden barriers for many learners, especially students, learners with print disabilities, a concept that my colleague Angela will explore in a short while. Um, and we're interested in knowing and hearing your thoughts on two specific questions that we have uh, laid out here on this slide. The first one being, what are the barriers that you see in your libraries? And um, the second one being, what solutions have you provided to your students to reduce 
these barriers. And um, Andrea, Lisa, and I um, encourage you to share your thoughts in the chat. Uh, Sorry. Throughout, um, <laughs> that's okay, Andrea. Throughout the workshop today, um, so that if we might forget something, uh, we'll go back to the chat and see if we could um, address it um, to, at the end of today's workshop. So please feel free to uh, share um, your thoughts on those two questions um, so that we could definitely address them if we do forget to do so um, throughout the presentation. We'll take a few moments just to type um, in the chat if you have any, you know, any ideas or if you've um, observed any barriers, I guess, um, in the library um, for your students with regards to accessibility. Okay, and then perhaps some solutions. And then at the end, we can at least, uh, we can address them a little bit. Okay, so I see that eBooks, <laughs> but students don't like eBooks. I know, <laughs> I know that, uh, yeah, I, I get that a lot. That's really interesting that, um, Laura, that you've mentioned that, that some students don't like eBooks because we found, I mean, I found sort of, I guess, similar, I mean, similar comments from students um, and it's funny that our students are so digitally oriented these days, but still obviously prefer, well, many prefer to read in print. Okay, that's a good comment. Okay, so finding out that some of our older students are not taking out books, thanks Bonnie. Okay, so only paper support. Melanie mentioned that from uh, CQ, CQSB. Hello, Central Quebec, I really, I missed, I like that board a lot. <laughs> I like all the boards, but I've worked with CQSB for a while and <laughs> I uh, just wanted to say hello. Um, okay, so some people are mentioning that they don't, um, they only have paper-based, um, print-based resources, um, the physical layout. Yeah, thanks for that comment, Julian. Finding the just right book, 100%. That's a huge issue um, because, you know, there's some students who really need uh, reading, you know, materials at, at a specific level. Um, and sometimes the assistive technology doesn't necessarily, um, you know, make that any uh, easier. Um, so that's also an issue. So for sure, Courtney, time. Okay, so these are all really good um, comments. And I think what we'll do is we're going to save this and maybe we can address some of these at the end. So thank you so much for your comments. Um, I'd love to just, you know, drop everything, have these, this conversation right now, <laughs> but we'll do that. We'll do that at the end. So thanks everybody. And keep commenting. If you have other comments, please, please keep going. Okay. Okay. So when we talk about accessibility, um, why does accessibility matter? Why is it so important for our students? Um, and really what is accessibility? Because that might not be familiar, a familiar term to many people. Okay. And actually the term accessibility and awareness for accessibility has been something that's really come up in maybe the past I don't know, 10 years or so, it's still fairly new. Um, but we know that access is a right and it's not a privilege, okay? Um, our students deserve and um, are entitled to environments that are accessible. Um, if we were in the States, this would be a very different conversation. Um, it's mandated into law in the US and different US states that students receive accessible resources. Uh, here, it's a little bit different in Canada. Um, but some provinces do have laws for accessibility, Ontario being one of them, very, very strict laws. Um, Quebec does as well, but I would say that some provinces are much more strict than others. Um, and we're starting to get sea changes, um, very much at the federal level, I think, um, for copyright and for other areas um, that involve accessibility. We've also shifted from a model of disability to more of an environmental model. So the little... Um, the little uh, graphic that Teresa had introduced, you know, shifting really to um, an environmental perspective, not so much the student being necessarily the, the problem per se. Um, you know, for years, we, we sort of thought of, you know, we have students and they have, you know, maybe learning disabilities or they might have visual impairments or other difficulties. Um, but now we're sort of shifting to the, what are the barriers for, for students um, in our schools? Not so much thinking of it you know, in the context of that student has a disability, but what are the barriers that exist in the environment and how can we reduce those barriers? So it's a real shift in thinking with universal design for learning, okay? So we know that when we reduce barriers, we increase access to the curriculum um, and also for student engagement. So we're not just talking about access to the curriculum, which is obviously incredibly important, but we're also talking about 
you know, reading for pleasure and for leisure. And that's really important for our students. Um, many of our students with dyslexia don't read for, for sorry, excuse me, for, for pleasure. You know, they're not, they're not what you would call readers. You know, they're not taking books home from the library just to read on their own. So we really, really wanna increase those options for our students. Um, you know, we want them to read in the summer and we want them to read independently. And we want them to enjoy reading and, you know, not see reading as a chore, right, that they have to do. So really reducing barriers incorporates everything um, along the lines of curriculum, but also really engagement for the student. Okay, so we know that students are, um, their brains are, are, I guess, variable, okay, and we we want to recognize that students, um, the student variability and diversity in our schools. Now, there's been a huge awareness campaign for, I think, for diversity, um, but not so much variability, okay, in terms of how students learn and how they, um, you know, how, basically how they learn and how they take in and understand um, the content of what they're learning, okay? And so we know that students vary in these three principles in terms of engagement and representation and action and expression. And I'm gonna explain that very quickly. I, we need four hours to go through what is universal design for learning, <laughs> but we're gonna try to do this really quickly, okay? Um, but we know that you know, students um, you know, have these variabilities and uh, you know, they, they learn in different ways. And just because we can't see the differences doesn't mean they're not there. Okay, so when they vary in terms of when students vary in terms of engagement, students are engaged and motivated by different different things. Okay, so some students are very um, engaged in a very um, noisy, busy environment in the classroom. I know you've seen this before as librarians, and some students are very introverted and they're not as engaged um, in a sort of a busy classroom setting. They'd rather be learning on their own. Okay, so those are differences in engagement and how students engage with um, content with material with others. Representation is essentially how teachers or other professionals represent information um, in the classroom. So, you know, we've, teachers, I think, have, you know, done this for years or focused on different types of representation. So, you know, we want to create visual, visual learning in the classroom. We want to have auditory learning. We want to have kinesthetic learning. We want to, we want to have all of those options available for students um, so that we can sort of I guess, best meet their needs, because we know that students um, learn in different ways, in different contexts. You know, there's no one um, hands-on learner. There's no one auditory learner. Those are all myths, actually. Learning styles are very much a myth in education. But what we do know is that when information is represented in different ways, students learn better, okay? They learn through hands-on learning. They learn through diverse experiences. So that's representation. And the third one, uh, is action and expression. Students are, are able to express themselves in different ways. Um, and their learning is stronger when they're able to do this, okay? So maybe you've seen in classrooms, students able to do like, you know, a play or a skit to represent their learning. Or maybe some of your students are making a maquette or a diorama to express their learning. You know, some students are very artistic and they really love to do that type of thing. Um, and some students are really good at expressing themselves in writing, okay? But the important thing is that we offer multiple options for our students, okay? So when we look at the neuroscience, it's very, very clear that those differences in the brain exist, okay? Um, and if you wanna see an incredible TED Talk, um, we're gonna leave you with the presentation. I think Teresa and Oralisa had put the link to the presentation in the chat. Um, and that Todd Rose TED Talk is the, one of the best things you'll ever see. So I really highly recommend um, that you you check that out because that literally, when I saw that TED talk, I was that that just blew me away. <laughs> I know I know it's going to do the same for you, so I highly recommend just viewing that after the session. Okay, so what is a print barrier? Let me just do a time check here. Okay, I think we're okay. Um, a print barrier is essentially very very different from the way we had thought about, um, I guess, learning disability or other disabilities in the past. So. You know, I had mentioned that we tended to think of, oh, the student has a learning disability, so that student can't possibly access the curriculum because they can't read, right? But now we tend to think of it in terms of, well, there seems to be a print barrier for that student, okay? So how can we remove that barrier or reduce that barrier so that student can access conventional print, okay? Or access um, what they have to read in the classroom or perhaps for independent reading, you know? so. Um, that's essentially the definition from the Canadian Copyright Act of Section 32. 
Um, and the Canadian Copyright Act actually has very, very clear definitions for um, print barriers as well as accessibility, um, you know, for Canadians, essentially, um, in, you know, not just students, um, everybody, all individuals. Okay. I just wanted to be clear about what accessible educational materials are before we dive into the um, demos. So these are resources that are designed to address learner variability. So we talked about how students learn differently and how their brains are all very different um, in the way that they learn. So these are materials that can be accessed in different ways. So print, digital, graphics, audio, video. Um, these are ways that students can access our traditional print material. Okay, so when we refer to accessible education and materials or AIM, um, that's what we're referring to. Okay, and if you ever want to go to the um, National Center on Accessible Instructional Materials, it's a it's a U.S. site um, associated with an organization called CAST. Okay, but it's actually very very informative, um, and it still very much applies to our school system as well. Okay, so I always put this up. I don't know if anyone has seen this before. I'm sure you have at some point. It's not new, but. This is a good illustration of how we're really looking at barriers and not so, you know, not, I, I wouldn't say so much the individual student as the barrier. Okay. We're really looking at the environment as a barrier. So we don't tend to think that books are a technology, but actually it's our biggest technology that we use. Print is everywhere, right? Students have access. I mean, they're encountering print in our libraries, in our classrooms, at home, in the community. Um, everywhere they go, they're going to need it in their careers, on the job. Print is, you, you can't avoid it, right? Um, so we sort of, if we look at it like this, what can we do to reduce the barriers for students when a student can't access a book, okay, um, due to their learning profile, okay? So let's talk about that, how we can actually um, reduce the barriers of print of a book. Okay. So I'm going to pass, um, I'm going to stop sharing. I'm going to pass this off to Elisa, who's going to continue with um, the AT tools that we use in our school. Right. So part two is going to be about um, accessibility in the library and how students can access print and books through different means other than just um, physical books or paper books. So the first thing I'm going to show you is about um, a word queue feature we call text-to-speech. And then we're going to talk about speech recognition in Google Chrome. And then finally, we're going to talk about some different curation tools and visual supports for research using read and write in Google Chrome. So I'll start off with talking about what text-to-speech is. So who is this for? Now, what is text-to-speech? We hear and we listen to the reading instead of reading with our you know, reading a regular book with our eyes. So students who struggle with decoding and fluency people who are second language learners and students with visual impairments. So that's really for the, um, obviously anybody and everybody can use this tool. Our school board offers WordQ for all computers, including staff and uh, students who may or may not have a learning difficulty. So everybody has access to it using a school device. Um, they also have access at home, but that's a different set of of hands. Now, if your school board does not offer WordQ, we do have a, a slide later on that will give different options for text-to-speech within certain devices such as you know, Chromebooks and, and iPads, things like that. What does text-to-speech do? So it allows students to focus on comprehension, so really understanding what is being said in the content of the book rather than focusing on sounding out words. And sometimes students can get stuck when they're trying to decode a word instead of, you know, and then you ask them later on, well, what did you understand from this? And they can't really tell you because, um, you know, they were so focused on trying to read the words rather than understanding what that was saying. Um, it also empowers uh, students to be independent. So independence is huge in a classroom where a student may feel a little bit different, um, where they can control their reading, they can control um, what what they're accessing and how many times they listen to it rather than, um, you know, having a teacher read it to them or you know, an attendant or something like that. Another thing is it expands their vocabulary because they may be choosing books that are not the right fit. Reading it aloud using text to speech may give them access to that knowledge 
Uh, whereas if they're picking it up to read it independently, like a regular print book, they may not have all of that vocabulary accessible to them. Um, listening to their own writing. So when they write, uh, for example, in Microsoft Word or in Google Docs, they can listen back to their own text that they've written, their own paragraphs by using text to speech. It also helps with word recognition. So they'll continue seeing the same words over and over again. Uh, and therefore, it'll kind of help with uh, retaining those words for later use. Uh, and then finally, they learn pronunciation of unfamiliar words. So if I've been pronouncing a word, you know, the wrong way, but then I hear it done the right way by word cue, then I'll know what it, what it should sound like, and then I can correct that. So these are some of the features, some of the, the advantages of using text-to-speech. But like we, I want to revisit is the universal design for learning is that this can be used for everybody. So the who it's for, for students, that also includes everybody and anybody. So anybody can use this tool and it can help them as well. So I'm going to demo what this will look like using a PDF that I've downloaded from the MSB's virtual library. Now, depending on your school board, you may have access to your own virtual library or your own uh, tools that are available through your, your school board's portal or you know, online platform. Um, if that is not a thing, then if that is something your school board does not offer, there's also Google Scholar. And we've put that link in there for you in case you wanna explore that. So Google Scholar is, um, it's like peer reviewed journals and also like uh, articles that are in PDF form uh, through the whole World Wide Web. So you can get anything and anything on, if you're researching a topic, you can actually search anything and access it through Google Scholar. However, some of these websites that they offer do require an extra subscription. So just watch out for that. But a lot of things are really free uh, using Google Scholar. So previous to this presentation, I've downloaded a PDF um, document, an article about global warming. So for example, if your student, if the student is coming to you and saying, I have a project on global warming, I'd like to have some, you know, some articles that kind of describe what that is, then this is one of the things that they can, they can find. And I'll show you how to use uh, this text with WordQ text to speech. Okay, so I'm just gonna exit this slideshow. And you should see my desktop right now. On my desktop, there is WordQ. Through the MSV, again, we have access to this. So I'll open that up. And what happens is you see a little toggle box here come up and that kind of floats over anything uh, that WordQ works with such as Microsoft Word and PDFs. So I have the PDF here on my main screen on my desktop that I've put, uh, let's say for example, for a student, they found something, they've downloaded it to their computer. And now I'm going to read it with WordQ. So I'll show you how to access this PDF we would go through options and click on open PDF. The reason why we go through WordQ to access this document is because it is, um, the functions will be accurate and will work perfectly with the PDF once we open it with this uh, software. So we'll click on open PDF and then it'll ask us to go and find what we're looking for. So which PDF are we trying to read with WordQ? And as you'll see, um, it is right here. If it's not directly on the first page, you'll go through and wherever you've saved it is where you're gonna go and look for it. So global warming, I wanna press open. And here I have uh, my document that I've downloaded. And now we have the document ready to go. And I have the features here and I'll be using the read function. So before I can click read, I have to do two things. I have to first click on select text, the A, the dark uh, A, and then that'll enable me to highlight any text on my PDF. So I can start with the title, I highlight, and then I click on read. Global warming. Okay, and it will stop after whatever you've highlighted. So anything you highlight, it, that's all it's going to read at the moment. I'll start, and I usually suggest uh, to do part by part just because it's less overwhelming, but I suggest that to students who, you know, depending on their needs, uh, if a student really wants to read everything at once, that's also an option if you highlight the entire text. So I'll show you again what that sounds like. The average surface temperature on Earth is slowly increasing. This trend is known as global warming. Okay, 
And furthermore, like in WordQ, there are options to slow down the reading, to change the voice. There are personalized settings there that you can go in and fix as a student and even as a, a staff member. So um, that is all found in options. I won't show that now, but just uh, wanted to show you the main text-to-speech feature that can really help students uh, listen to the reading, have that comprehension um, without having the overwhelming task of sometimes decoding a word rather than really understanding what that text is trying to say. So that's what I wanted to show you today about text-to-speech. I'm going to close this. So the next slide actually shows you the step-by-step -step on what I've just shown you. So to open WordQ, go to open PDF, select the PDF, and then select text and click on read. So those are the steps that I've just shown you. And if ever you want to return to this, if you've forgotten or you really want to get to know how to do it, uh, it's always going to be here on this slide. Instructions on how to read using text-to-speech. And then if your school board or anything like that doesn't have access to WordQ, then these are some options you can click on. These are links. So on an iPad, how can you read aloud? How can you have the same feature used? Uh, again, using a narrator feature in Windows. So these are instructions on how to do that. Uh, natural reader on a Mac, on a Chromebook, and on an Android device, such as a tablet or even a phone. So these are, it's just proof that accessibility is starting to kind of come up everywhere um in all devices and not necessarily through a paid software so these are really nice to have um and for you to go back to to explore later on elisa can i sorry can i interrupt for two seconds of course okay sorry about this um just there was a question i think from a few people saying they don't have word queue in the library um which might be the case because some students some school boards i know only provide word queue to students with um who have ieps or who require text-to-speech um, but I just want to mention that text-to-speech is the most prolific assistive technology in terms of um, ability to access for free. So the links that we just showed you or that are up there right now, um, text-to-speech is pretty much built into every device. Okay, so if you don't have access to WordQ, not to worry, um, you can enable text-to-speech on any device for free. Okay, and actually most of our schools have Windows machines and actually the option to use um, text-to-speech is right there. It's literally control window enter, um, which enables narrator, and that will allow the student to use text-to-speech immediately on a Windows machine. Okay, but don't, text-to-speech is one of those things now that is so commonplace um, that you can access it really anywhere. Okay, I just wanted to mention that because I know some people were, you know, worried they don't have access to WordQ. Right, and I, I yeah, thank you for that, Andrea. Um, it's a real, it's real, like it's our own accessibility issues too within our school board. So um, we just, Sometimes it just takes asking, right? So if there is somebody in your school board or service center that is in charge of technology or even uh, literacy, maybe sending that question out to them, um, they may not, you know, have the same title as us, but somebody also can maybe um, is worth asking at the school board that you work at or the service center to see what is accessible for you guys. So. Research with talk and type. So now this is a different feature um, that is different from text-to-speech. So, so text-to-speech really read out loud through the computer, through the software that you're using. Whereas this tool here is really you talking, the student talking, and um, the software typing out what is being said live. So who is this for? Again, it is for everybody, but not always useful for everybody. So we wanna make sure Students with dyslexia and dysgraphia really benefit from this tool. Students who struggle to get their ideas down on paper, difficulty with fine motor skills. Now, why is that important? Um, that means a student who is physically writing with a pen and pencil or even typing could be difficult. So this is kind of um, giving them the opportunity to put their ideas out, but through their voice and through the microphone in, integrated within the device. Uh, and then students with um, visual impairments. Um, now, what does it do? The talk and type tool converts speech into text. So literally we'll take the words they are saying and convert it to text and to typed text. Um, this is a lot, it's very similar. Some, some of you may have smartphones and what this, it looks like on your own phone is if you are writing a text, but let's say you're, you're driving or you're, you know, in a car is a perfect example. A lot of cars now have this speech speech to text or talk and type feature within your own phone. So if you're speaking out your text and then it types it for you, that's talk and type, that's speech to text that we're talking about. 
So just to kind of put it into context that it is really everywhere, this is uh, a little bit more specific to writing on a computer or writing an assignment or a work a learning uh, activity, but it is accessible to everybody all the time if you have those kinds of tools like a smartphone. Um, you can write down a couple sentences or even just a whole entire essay. Uh, and then it also works in both English and French in our school board. The word cube does that. And also um, we're going to talk about read and write through Google Chrome, which also has this feature and works English and French. Okay, so this is um, something that everybody has access to, which is Google. Whoops, I went too far. Um, research using speech recognition in Google. So a really cool thing that we want to show you today is another demo and is how Google has an integrated microphone in it in a Google search. So it's accessible in Google and everybody has access to it. So a really important thing is to make sure um, the internet or Google Chrome has microphone um, accessibility turned on. So it'll ask you to access your mic and you do have to press allow for this to work. Okay, so I'll demonstrate that right now. So right now I've just opened a new tab, I'm in Google and I have this microphone feature here. Now, instead of actually typing it, this is where the speech comes in. So I would click on the microphone. I would click on allow for the microphone. There you see that I do have to click allow. If I press block, it will not work. So allow, try again. Global warming. So I've searched global warming and it immediately brings me to a page. I didn't have to click anything. I simply just had to say the words. So the only thing I clicked was the microphone and then off it went to research what I wanted. So I scroll down and here's where the trackpad or the mouse comes in handy. And then you go in and you really click and, and kind of discover this topic. Um, again, you do have the microphone again here where you don't have to go back to a new tab. You can just go back here and global warming in well, let's try that again. Global warming in Canada. So if I want to be more specific, I can add some more keywords if that just wasn't specific enough. Again, these are all research functions that you can access on your own. And that's about it. Now, again, you can um, go to the French option and speak in French instead if you're researching something in French, which is also really, really helpful to know is that it's not only offered in one language. Google is very universal and they understand that um, people speak all languages and you can change that feature. Here, I'll hand off to Teresa. I'm going to stop sharing. Perfect. So these are um, just some of the curation tools for research that we use uh, within our board, um, within um, the read and write toolbar. And um, I'm going to direct your attention to the icons that we have um, here at the top left corner. So the first one is the highlighter function. Um, and so essentially students could use the highlighter function that displays in the read and write toolbar to color code information, uh, be it on a web page, on a Google doc, in a PDF, et cetera. And once they've done highlighting, what's cool is that they can actually export their highlights from um, wherever they were into a Google Doc with the collect highlights um, icon here. And it would look like this, essentially. I will show you a live demo in just a, um, a little while, but essentially the uh, highlights um, get exported into a Google Doc um, within the drive. And what's interesting as well, uh, to facilitate their research um, and the creation, sorry, of the uh, reference page, the bibliography, uh, are the links to the sites that the students are using. So um, that's a really um, a great tool for, for students to help them um, keep track of the information uh, and the sources uh, that they're using. With the highlight feature, we can also, in addition to exporting um, highlights into a Google Doc, students can also create vocabulary lists. So um, the icon here is the vocab um, creation uh, icon. So students, uh, when they're researching uh, and reading something on, 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 online, if there are certain words that they're unfamiliar with that they wanna master uh, and incorporate in their own vocabulary, uh, what they can do is highlight these words uh, directly on the web page or in a Google Doc, and then click on this icon. 
And again, a vocabulary list document will generate uh, in Google Drive, and it will look something like this. Uh, whereby the word that was highlighted will be included with the definition. Um, and if a symbol is available, then a symbol will also be included in the vocabulary list. Um, what uh, is also interesting is the section for notes. So students could check their own understanding of words by um, paraphrasing the definition in their own words in the notes section. This could be used in multiple ways as not only an instructional tool um, to teach vocabulary, but students can also build these vocabulary lists themselves for studying purposes uh, and to enrich uh, their uh, vocabulary in a given topic. So the demo uh, we'll be uh, exploring today for these curation tools um, are based on the following scenario. So we have a grade 11 student who is researching on the topic of personal finance, specifically learning about budgeting. Um, and this student would like to collect their highlights from a website. We'll be using a, a Government of Canada finance website um, into a Google document for reference when they're writing their research report. They find this tool particularly helpful because it not only includes a citation, um, uh, but it will also help uh, export all of their notes from that website directly into a doc that they could uh, pa then paraphrase in. We're then going to look at um, how the student can build their vocabulary and comprehension regarding certain financial concepts by highlighting the words and then clicking on the vocabulary list icon so that a vocabulary list gets generated into their Google Drive. So again, these are the tools that we will be using in this uh, demo. Um, also worth mentioning, there are hyperlinks throughout the presentation that my colleagues and I have included. So you can always make reference to these videos um, at a later date. So the link to our demo is this website here. Now, in order to activate Read and Write, we'll have to click on the purple puzzle piece. It is a, a Google Chrome extension. So once it's been installed um, to Chrome, then one would simply click on it. And there you go. So the toolbar appears over here. Now, we're going to um, pretend to be the student uh, and the student is navigating the website and sees that the website is divided into different sections. So they're going to uh, go to the top. Um, we're highlight a couple of things in the why, uh, why make a budget. So we'll color code this um, using, uh, let's choose yellow for this, um, this section here. Um, we'll highlight a couple of points to reference here in yellow as well. So that's that category. Then as we go down, we notice a section on um, the financial goals component. So we could choose to um, highlight this in a different color. Um, so we'll choose uh, green. And then at the bottom here, there is a distinction between a need and a want. So the students might feel the need to highlight this in a different color, like that. Once the highlighting is done, once a student has gone through the text and highlighted this important information, they'll simply go um, over the collect highlights feature, click on it, press OK uh, to collect the colors that were um, chosen. And a notification uh, here uh, will say that a document uh, was created uh, was generated with the highlights and it, it exports them for us. The link, like I mentioned earlier, is included here. So the student could simply keep track of their, um, the source. So now we'll create, I just refreshed it to remove the, uh, the highlights that I had before for the, um, the collected highlights um, demo. Now I'll show you how we could create vocabulary lists for students who want to um, master certain concepts in a given uh, subject. So again, we'll click on the read and write toolbar. We'll find a couple, we'll stick to this paragraph here and I'll go ahead and I'll highlight a couple of uh, words. I can stick with the same color in this case. Uh, so we'll choose purple. So we'll choose money, we'll choose uh, obviously budget, um, income, 
savings and expenses. So once these words are highlighted, we could go on, hover over the vocabulary list feature, click on it, and again, uh, it will tell us that a new document uh, is being generated in the Google Drive. Here it is. So students will have access to the words, to the definitions, to symbols, and of course, the notes section here, um, should they wish to uh, you make use of that section. Because of the nature of a Google Doc, they can always edit certain parts if they need to delete, uh, let's say a part of the definition, it's too long or whatnot, they can manipulate the document as, need, uh, as needed. Marisa? Okay. Yes. Um, I think maybe because we only have till 1145, um, maybe what we'll do is, um, maybe we'll just go to some of the library stuff. Um, just because I'm worried we're not going to be able to get through everything. <laughs> Sounds good, Andrea. Absolutely. And you know what? Okay? I wasn't seeing the time. So absolutely. And again, the links uh, are included. So um, there's, uh, there's always references uh, for these, uh, this section here. Okay. I know. I'm so sorry to cut it short. Um, I know that everybody wants to see the visual supports. Um, I don't necessarily know who has read and write in your school board. I know Lester B. Pearson is a Google board and Eastern uh, Townships as well. Um, but I know that Riverside is very much a Microsoft board. Um, so there's other boards. We might not all have the same tools. So I think we'll leave it at that. Um, ESSB, oh, thank you, Lily, for letting me know you have Google. Okay, so that's good to know. I think we need a whole workshop on Google. <laughs> so maybe table that for a later date. I just wanted to make sure to get, um, just to give you some information on the libraries in case anyone is, is interested in that aspect, because that's a big chunk of what we do as well. I'm so sorry, Elisa, to cut that short. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna share my screen. Okay, and you know what, I'll try to whiz through this and then maybe we'll have some extra time at the end for demos, okay? Because I know everybody's enjoying the demos, which is great. Okay, I just wanted to just briefly touch base on these or uh, on these um, platforms that we use. Um, this section is called multi-sensory reading with accessible books and novels. Um, again, I just want to acknowledge Annette's work for this. She was uh, instrumental in, in getting this into our school boards. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about Bookshare, Sela, and Sora. We also have a project called the Accessible Reading Quebec Project that we did a number of years ago at the ministry level. There's a ton of um, research and um, you know, work from Lester B. Pearson School Board and EMSB on that site. Okay, so I'm just going to move ahead. Um, so what is multi-sensory reading? It's essentially um, an ebook, okay, but it's an enhanced accessible ebook. So I know that, you know, some, some uh, professionals said that their students are not very engaged in ebooks. Um, this is a little bit different because this is designed specifically for students with reading disabilities, learning disabilities, visual impairment, anyone who has a print barrier essentially. Um, so this is called multi-sensory reading. And the reason that it's called that is it allows the student to listen to the text and also to follow along with highlighted text. Okay. So um, I can actually show you what that looks like in action, if I can get my Mac back up and running. <laughs> but what it is, is it allows the students to watch the highlighted text on the screen, similar to when you're using, they're using text to speech, and also to hear the book at the same time. So it's very different from just sort of reading an ebook on a Kobo or um, you know, a traditional ebook on Sora, okay? Although Sora does have accessible uh, books available, okay? So this is what um, an example of what our book list looks like. I'm just gonna go on to the next slide fairly quickly. I wanted to describe what are these digital libraries. So our students access accessible books through these two platforms, okay? They're free, completely free. Um, and there are books that can be read on mobile, devi mobile devices, Chromebooks, and laptops, okay? So any device the student has, anything you have in your library, the one thing it's not available on is a Kobo or a Kindle, you know, like a, an e-reader. Um, those typically do not have accessible features um, built in, okay? And these are only available to stu students under Canadian copyright law. So essentially, they're not open to all. They're only available to students who have print disabilities, okay? Uh, so we go next. Okay, so student eligibility, who's eligible, essentially. So this is under copyright legislation, both in the US and in Canada. We have two libraries. SELA is a Canadian library. Okay, Bookshare is a US library. 
Now we access Bookshare through CELA. We have an agreement or essentially CELA has an agreement um, with Bookshare to offer books in English um, only. Essentially, there's no French available on Bookshare um, to our students. Okay, so it's very clear who has access to this. Um, it's essentially students with print barriers, okay? So we'll just go through the, um, I'm not gonna go through this in great detail. This is for you for later, if you want to know who can refer, who is eligible. Um, we have equivalent Quebec codes there um, from the ministry. So really these are the categories. These are students who are eligible for this service, okay? Um, it's generally, it's not it's the, really the, the only students that it very much, I guess, you know, I don't want to say excludes, but really for second language learners, it's not really, it's not a resource for second language learners. Okay. So that's really the only, um, the only criteria. It's really for students with print barriers. Okay. So what is CELA? CELA is a Canadian platform. Okay. And we have a, um, basically it's, it's, sorry, I should say that individual um, educators or librarians can have access to CELA. Okay. We don't have a board account uh, for CELA. The teacher or the librarian has to apply individually for an account, okay? But once you have an account, there's a ton of Canadian titles available and there's many titles available in French, okay? The, um, the, basically there's different formats available for students, um, primarily audio, okay? So if your student needs an audio book and you don't have it on Sora, or you don't have access to Sora, we generally look to CELA to access those audiobooks. Okay. And the nice part about this platform is that the audio is narrated. It's not necessarily a synthetic voice, it's a real human voice, which is a big bonus for students with dyslexia. Okay. Um, we usually use CELA on an iPad. Okay. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Go ahead, Teresa. Yeah, you can switch. Thank you. Um, our second platform that we use is called Bookshare. And Bookshare is a US platform. We get it through CELA, okay? Now this platform is managed by uh, Julian, by our board librarian, who you all know. <laughs> and so he helps us manage this. Um, and so this platform has English only, actually some Spanish because it's a US platform, but it's excellent for ELA um, books, not class novels, independent reading. It's sort of like walking into Indigo, you know, the big bookstore has tons of current titles. Um, it's like, it's literally like walking into a library, a current library, but they have a lot of current titles, which is really, really excellent for our students. So, you know, if the student is looking for wonder, you can find it. If the student is looking for a bestseller or a new book that has just come out in the past few weeks, Bookshare has it, which is really great for our students because they can get the newest materials really quickly. Okay, so I know I'm very much going through this quickly, Okay, but I just wanted to share how our students read. Now, you don't have to, you know, stress out about this because I know this is a lot of like tech information, I should say. Okay, but what really matters when student reads is the file format that it comes in. Okay, so the first thing to look at, you know, for these platforms is what file format will my student read in and how can they read it? Okay, because some devices will read certain file formats and others won't. Okay, so we made a handy little chart Okay, in terms of what CELA has and what Bookshare has, okay, and how our students read, because they can read online, they can read offline, they can read um, just audio, just having their audio available, they can read with audio and highlighted text, there's many, many options to read, okay, so whatever you have available, your student can read on that device, okay, don't feel like you have to get a lot of devices in there, it's whatever you have available in your libraries, okay. Um, again, I'm not going to go through this in great detail, but when you look at the file formats available, you want to know what assistive technology can read that file format. Okay, so we know that when we have EPUBs, read and write can read the file format. We know when we have Word, WordQ, Natural Reader, Immersive Reader, which is a free Microsoft product, that can read Word. Okay, PDFs. We know that we have word queue. We know that we have read and write. So it really depends what file format the student is reading in. And then what compatible assistive technology can actually read that file format. Okay, so that's a consideration. Okay, when you're looking at the different file formats. So just to finish off, I wanted to share how some of our students are accessing Bookshare. Um, so these are just different examples. Um, you know, we work with students from 
uh, really, you know, well, not so much cycle one elementary, but I'd say cycle two, so grade three, four, up until um, cycle two out, uh, secondary or grade 11. And so these are how some of our students access. Um, some students read in Microsoft Word, right? Because they really like WordQ, okay? Some students read on an iPad, okay? And they, we have an app called Easy Reader um, where we can access all the Bookshare novels and SELA novels. And so some students will read on an iPad, okay? Then we have some students who are heavy users of read and write. So if you're a Google board and you're using read and write, um, just know that you can access these books through read and write um, as an EPUB and all the amazing features that Teresha has showed you in terms of curation, you have that ability with a book from Bookshare. So students can highlight their text, they can extract highlights, they can curate, annotate, there's all different kinds of options, okay? And there's also the option to read online with Bookshare, okay? So there's different ways to access it. I'm just gonna go through a little bit um, of how we manage this, okay? You can see there that I have my reading lists, okay? So what Julian does is he, um, he gets referrals from the teachers and from us as assistive technology consultants, and we add students to the list who are eligible. So you can see there that those are the schools that I'm um, helping with their book lists, essentially helping manage their book lists. So as an example, um, for coronation grade six, what I've done is I've added a number of books for the students that are on that list, and they can access it on any device that they have available to them, okay? So um, that's what really the book lists look like online. Um, and you can have, it's almost like, it's like having your own personal virtual library, okay? Which is so nice for our students and so empowering for them for, you know, we've had so many students say that they, they're, you know, they, they're not readers, right? And they wanna be able to read, but they, you know, they can't really in the traditional sense. So this is a different way for them to access their, um, their novels and their books, which is really, and it's been an incredible, um, it's just been an amazing resource for our students. Um, and we've had such an excellent feedback from our students on these tools, okay? So it's really a team effort. Um, this is our process of how we do this. I'd say for more information, please feel free to contact us. Our contact info is there. You can contact our uh, assistive tech team or obviously Julian who manages um, our account uh, for Bookshare. But I have to say Bookshare is one of the best things we ever did. <laughs> Um, and one of the best things we have for our students, and it's all free, which has been amazing. So it took some time to set up, but once we got it up and running, um, we, it's, it's amazing. So I can't recommend it enough um, as a resource. Um, and if you want to be the point person, we, we really start with librarians in our, school, in our schools who are really you know, ensuring that our students have access to, uh, to these tools and to these platforms. Okay, so I will stop there because I think we're over time. Um, there's some resources there on Bookshare that please feel free to use. If you wanna share them with your high schools, there's a flyer that we use for ELA teachers and you can just feel free to change the name to your own school board. <laughs> we have no problems. Uh, there's an overview for high school students. When we give them their Bookshare accounts, we give them something that they can you know, hold on to with some information for their parents as well, if they're interested. And then there's an overview of how to get this going. So like how, if you were interested in getting this going in your school board, how do I do this? Okay. So it's a program overview of how this works. Okay. Um, so thank you so much. I'm sorry that we didn't have more time because an hour doesn't do it justice. Really? <laughs> we could spend hours and hours on this topic because I know we're, we're all passionate about it. And we wanted to thank you so much for being such a wonderful audience um, and for being with us across the province. So thank you again. Wow. Okay. That was a lot. Uh, yeah, it's a lot. <laughs>